Welcome, everybody, to Gameology, episode 49. I am one of your permanent co-hosts, Matthew Falva, and I'm joined by... Toa Gabriel Brzezinski. We're talking about Super Mario Odyssey. Pretty exciting times. A new Mario game, super hyped up, was the best-selling Nintendo Switch game before it released because of all the pre-order hype. Um, I see a lot of parallels to when Mario first made its 3D appearance on the N64 in a way that it feels like something a bit new, a bit of a reset for Mario, although it's taking a lot of elements from 3D games. But one of the big things I notice is that um, whereas Ocarina of Time took a lot of elements because the same team made 64 and Ocarina of Time and they could workshop elements in Mario that didn't work and move them over to Zelda. I see so many things from Breath of the Wild in this game. So that was like some of my bir- uh, my first big impressions. But what have been uh, your impressions of this game so far? Well, neither of us have actually gotten like super far into the game at this point. And yeah. I want to preface this episode by saying we're going to avoid any spoilers, right? We're not going to like give away stuff about the game. Uh, anyone who listens to this, we're just talking about like overall design and decisions and stuff. So don't feel like by listening to this episode, you're going to have anything spoiled. Um, that being said, I really like it. I think this is a absolutely solid Mario game. Um, I think that Galaxy is always going to hold a special place in my heart. Sure. Um, but I think that this game is one of the best evolutions on the Mario formula. Like, contrasting how um, Galaxy seemed like the best game that you could get out of the Mario formula in the in the line of, like, Mario 64 and Mario Sunshine. Galaxy seems like the perfect way that that formula was, like, worked out. In the same way that... Uh, and at least in my opinion, Twilight Princess seemed like the best Zelda game that followed the formula established by Ocarina of Time and then reappeared in Wind Waker. And then Twilight Princess was the sort of end point for that, at least as far as I see it. And then by the time we hit uh, Skyward Sword, it was kind of like an awkward step between things. In the same way, uh, Mario 3D World on the Wii U seemed like a very safe bet. Did you, do you, what do you think? Yeah, I think 3D World, while it had some creative elements with it, it felt like a lot like New Super Mario Brothers, where it was, it was like a remix. It was kind of, here's a lot of stuff you know, and we're just going to mix it all together. It's going to have elements of 3D and 2D Mario. There's, there may be interesting things in the New Super Mario Brothers and Super Mario 3D World in the land. But I, I walk away from those games and I, I never really have a lot of memories of them. It just kind of is this fun little jaunt. But yeah. there's nothing... There's there's very little that they do that's that's new enough that really strikes you in a way. Like when you play Sunshine, obviously you have the flood and cleaning up and you have the way those worlds are designed. Um, Galaxy, I mean the gravity mechanics. And of course with Odyssey, you have Cappy which just completely is is unique whereas in 3d world i love uh that being a fan of, i'm more so a fan of the 2d marios so i like the more obstacle course design of those so i like 3d world in that manner but i 3d world is just it, it was very bland yeah i know what you mean like i think we're both in agreement that it was a good game it like yeah but a lot of the a lot of the, the new things in that game were very small it was the uh, like a couple brief ventures into the Captain Toad sort of experimental design. Um, we got the cat suit, which had like made his debut in a couple levels and made for some unique experiences. But as you say, like having Cappy and the whole capture mechanic in yeah. Mario Odyssey is really what's going to make this game feel different. And the settings and the worlds you go to are going to sew a much more concrete picture in your mind and then the then 3D world. Now, if you want to talk about Cappy, I think the biggest compliment I could give to this game is that Cappy's ability to act as a temporary platform is so genius that I don't know if I could imagine another Mario game without it. Because, you know, we talk a lot about gameplay mechanics in the show, obviously. And what yeah. I really like about Cappy is that 
it doesn't it it just allows Mario to continue what he's already doing. Mario jumps on platforms. So now you have a temporary platform that you can place and you can combine the way you've combined Mario's 3D maneuvers has always been one of my favorite parts of the 3D games and Cappy's such a beautiful extension of that where with Flood okay it helped him jump and land but it slowed things down and it made um, the platforms have to be much larger and it just I did I wasn't a huge fan of that it made things a lot easier um, and you know in 3D world if you pick Princess you have the same option but with this one you see you see so many instances in this game where you'll see a moon in some very awkward spot and you're like I bet you I could figure a way of combining wall jump cappy a dive I mean my favorite thing now is to, you jump you throw that cap you dive onto that cap you jump off it um, cuz when you dive and you bounce off that cap and like the the possibilities that a skilled player the crazy things you could do um, there's already like some pretty amazing uh, race videos where people are like hacking the race in, in ways that maybe were intended, maybe weren't. Um, and that's really for me what is the, the best part of this game. We, I'll talk a little bit more about my thoughts on transformation, but I wanted to hear your thoughts on Cappy. Yeah, I mean, for me, like I, I think of Cappy almost entirely from the capture mechanic perspective. Mm. I actually haven't been playing the game much using Cappy as a temporary platform, just mm. at all. I'm using Mario's traditional moveset, the like backflips, the wall jumps, just like the and the long jumps as well. And I find that anywhere that you you can do a long jump, like you can throw Cappy out and use him as an in-between platform, but you yeah. can also just perform like it seems like anytime two platforms are far apart, that's yeah. long jump distance. So they, it's, it feels like the game's worlds and environments are still very much calibrated to that, uh, like, distances and heights based on Mario's traditional moveset. You know, really quickly, about the, yeah. the distances, what I love that Nintendo does is they, they will set up the distances almost always in a way that a full normal jump will make the distance perfectly, or a full long jump will make the distance perfectly, or um, an up flip or something will make it. They they do a good job of not kind of making you have to jump halfway because the 3D platforming is so complicated in that manner to land perfectly. So I just yeah. think they do a great job of intuitively designing the game to reward you to just trust Mario's jump. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's it's a really nice, consistent feel. And honestly, from having built a platformer, even just a two dimensional one. Um, where I knew exactly what the full height of, uh, in Robo's world, what Robo's jump was normally versus his spring height jump. Like I just built the level in increments like that. Like I literally had like a measuring stick hmm. object that I would place and know like, okay, Robo's going to jump from here to here. That's just one complete jump or this is one complete spring jump. Yeah. So I find it's almost easier to construct levels by using those kind of absolute measures and it, yeah as you say there, there really isn't any point to having any half measures because that would just make it more complicated the one thing i do really like though about the freedom of movement that you get with mario's moveset is even when you're doing something like the long jump something that's supposed to propel you really far the ability to correct for that like you can initiate a long jump and then just hold back on the control stick and mario will barely move forward at all so if you last minute decide, oops, I initiated a long jump, but I don't actually want to go the full distance, you can practically cancel it out. It's insane how much they let you correct and make those small adjustments. And a lot of what Cappy, a lot of Cappy's abilities, not the capture abilities, but the sort of core abilities help you in that regard. Um, I really liked in Mario uh, Galaxy the switch, the spin that you got when you flicked the Wii Remote. Mm-hmm because it gave you that tiny extra bit of airtime and that tiny extra yeah. height correction. And when you throw Cappy, you get that same tiny height boost and tiny like delay time. So I appreciate the, like, the input that the player has to make to make those small corrections, because that way it's not correcting it for you but it's not making you plan it out perfectly in your head when you initiate the jump. Do you know what I mean? No, absolutely. It's uh, those little measures. Like when I think of the wall jump, I think is a perfect and the way the cat suit was and the way Cappy is and the way Mario's dive now is 
the old um, hold the hold the Z button before you press the I don't know the dive button. Those are those are like the wall jump is in traditionally like say you have a platform wall. If you're jumping towards that wall and you don't land on the top of it, but your player would normally hit the wall and fall straight down to their death, maybe the wall jump is a way that a quick thinking player can jump out. It's that last ditch effort. And it's it fits in with the challenge. It's just giving you another chance, and it makes you feel like here's here's a little mini game for you to do if that one didn't work out. Now that's why I like coming from Mario 64 and the other 3D Mario games. Love the long jump, one of my favorite things. That extra little boost, you're sacrificing height for that extra bit of length. Uh, it feels like Mario's got a rocket on him. It's so fun. But I now I've almost I still use the long jump, but I've really switched over to using the the hat and then especially that dive. And for me, the dive is something I'll, to, I'll go to if I think I'm not going to make that. That little bit of dive hops you over. But you do lose in the process the ability to do a butt jump. And how you were mentioning you can hold back on the control stick to correct if you've maybe gone too far. The butt jump has always been that that um, fix they've put in the 3D games to make it easier to manipulate a 3D environment where you watch the shadow... Mario's is the shadows in the right spot you hit that butt jump button you're gonna go straight down it's gonna ignore all physics and it's just something that makes 3d platforming easy but when you do the dive you don't have that so it's yeah it's just they've just added more and I love that you you, you, you sorry. yeah I love that you keep calling it the butt jump like not the ground pound not the butt stomp not oh yeah butt jump <laughs> well I'm a simple man with simple pleasures and it's uh and I, what, what I like is that you've played in such a different way than I have, where you've just yeah. used Cappy in a certain way, and I haven't. And it's that, again, reminds me of Breath of the Wild, where people might have vastly different experiences on what appears to be uh, that Mario would be more of a simple game. Absolutely, yeah. And it's um, just talking about like other sort of similarities to Breath of the Wild. I mean, the the environment that is like really rich with just stuff to try out, like... The fact that there are so many different contextual things, instead of in Breath of the Wild where you would like pop open your Sheikah Slate and start using like Magnesis or Time Stopping or any of the other like bomb glyphs, in Mario Odyssey, instead there's an enemy usually nearby. Sometimes it's a bit of a distance away to make it a bit of a puzzle, um, but that you can hop into with Cappy and... Mm being able to have these sort of contextual control schemes, I think it's a very strong way to augment the, like Mario's regular move set. Because now when you have something that is much more of an emphasis on jumping, you hop into a frog. That's one of the very first captures in the game. Um, if you have something that, is now going to give Mario the ability to like aim and shoot, then you pop into something else. Um, so these, the way that they are able to tweak the control scheme and the abilities that Mario have really unlock all these different kinds of puzzles um, and like platforming experiences. So I think that's one of the most brilliant things about the capture mechanic is how much variety it gives the gameplay. Mm -hmm. And you can just hop from one thing to another even the fact that um, as you pop out of something that you've captured, you get that extra little bit of jump height. So you can yeah. get like right up to the edge on something and then pop out of it. And then you're able to like grab up onto the ledge. Like it's, it's great. It's the, it's a continuation of the Yoshi mechanic of ditching Yoshi to sacrificing <laughs> yeah. Yoshi to, yeah, to make that much. extra couple inches. It's, you know, with the capture mechanic, I'm a little bit torn. Whereas, hmm. I like that it's something different. I like that it adds such a wide variety to it. And at first, though, I thought I didn't like it because with Cappy, I like his temporary platform ability because it continues Mario's skills, the skills that I'm going to be using the whole game. Whereas when I mm -hmm. became a T-Rex, sure, it was like a kind of a power fantasy, but... I didn't like that it was clunky, and I felt like it was just kind of a gimmicky mini game. where I thought, wouldn't it have been better where instead of me turning into a frog that maybe moves slower, like, why not just now that Mario has a frog hat on, his regular jump is just a lot higher. And I can see why maybe that would be a bit confusing, where you don't want to have people acting too differently with Mario where like they want you to get used to like these are Mario's moves these are the yeah. frogs moves these are the goombas no, and that's then, exactly it yeah yeah and then and then also the more i played i realized these levels are so large 
that like Zelda, you need to be able to pace your own gameplay because you could spend a long time backtracking, looking for things, just messing around and finding secrets. It's not, this isn't 3D World where you have 300 seconds to get through the game. This is yeah. through the level. This is do it at your own pace. You might spend an, like an hour just trying to get into a cage that has, um, you know, a lunar thing, a moon. So I can see why being able to switch it up and be a Goomba for a little bit would be pretty interesting. So that, that part grew on me eventually. Yeah, I definitely think it's one of those things where as you get to see all the different and, and that's perhaps one of my favorite things um, in much the same way that Breath of the Wild brought us this idea of try stuff out. Like, yeah. what happens when I capture this? What are this thing's ability? What can I capture? What can't I capture? Yeah. Like, it it just gives you this want to explore and discover like all the different things you can hop into into the world um it's yeah just from that perspective alone from the 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 discovery that it awards um and just the the surprise and the delight of like what what happens what are the different abilities of this thing what new challenges can i take on because i have this particular move set now um yeah, I think it's a great thing to have brought to this game, and it, I think it's probably one of the most defining features mm -hmm. among several other changes. Sure, it's it's like Breath of the Wild encouraged you to actually look at the world because there were many things you could find that wouldn't ever be on a mini-map, where instead of just loading up your mini-map with icons so you're constantly staring at the part of the game you shouldn't be looking at, they would have the Sheikah Slate vibrate so that you knew you should keep your eyes open, which is yeah. one of my favorite mechanics ever put into modern gaming. And, and Mario does that in the same way. It's look around, you don't know what you could put your cap on, but it might be pretty funny. Maybe this, you know, these binoculars, this tank, this, uh, the lightning pole. Oh, speaking of the lightning pole, when Nintendo announced they had HD Rumble, I mm -hmm. thought, this is dumb. I mean, who cares about HD Rumble? It's going to make this Joy-Con cost way more. It's going to mean that it's not going to have a, a headphone port. But this game in the HD Rumble is phenomenal. I think it's one of the coolest features that's been put into modern gaming again. Oh, I just handed it out twice. I'm consistently amazed by how accurate that feels like I, today I was on a spinning platform that slowly rotated the way the lightning feels as you travel along a line. It's astounds me over and over again. Yeah. I, I can't wait to see like what other stuff is done with HD rumble. Like it, it definitely brings like the, the whole idea of having rumble in a controller to begin with was to increase the sense of immersion that you got. Yes. Now that you're actually able to get these sort of like different textures and stuff. Like I had, some cool experiences using other modern controllers like the um the xbox one controller has its like four different rumble things the trigger rumble stuff um this though is one of the first times that i felt like the xbox one controller thing felt gimmicky to me mm. having my trigger vibrate when i run out of ammo always felt terrible when i was playing halo um, but all the stuff that, like the, the way the rubble augments the experience in this Mario game definitely feels much more on point. And it definitely, you know, when you're on a rotating platform, as you were mentioning, and you get that sort of like jolt when it first starts moving and then the slight rumble as it clicks into place, yeah, it, it all feels like, yeah, that's what you would feel as if you were standing on such an object, such a it, it actually feels like it's rotating. Yeah, the way and you can you could you could hand that to somebody that has their eyes closed and they could tell you whether it's rotating clockwise or counterclockwise. Yeah, it's nuts. It's I mean, um, uh, yeah, it's it went from gimmick to like everybody should be doing this and this feels so far advanced. Like since when is Nintendo ahead on technology? It's pretty amazing. It seems like something that all VR manufacturers should be striving to have. Yeah, I completely agree. Having more advanced haptics in VR, it would be awesome to feel this level of fidelity uh, now, as long as we're complimenting joy cons sure i've been feeling kind of under the weather these past couple days okay one of the things i love the most is playing with the split joy cons and just like having my arms like crossed yeah. over or just kind of laying off to the side it doesn't matter i can play the game however i want not having to physically hold a controller up in front of me yes it's surprisingly relaxing it's just like oh i could just get comfy i can put my hands behind my head if you i could, want yeah 
I do that often, actually. I mean, if I'm laying in bed on my side, I might have an arm behind my head and like in crazy positions. And it seems until you've, until you've like in practice, it's on paper, it seems kind of dumb, but in practice, it's, it's so much better because it's not really natural to have your hands in front of you. And and it's, uh, yeah, that is a wonderful thing. And maybe the joy cons are a little bit small if you're going to be handing them off to somebody for multiplayer play, but in essence, (laughs) yeah. Yeah. Like I've got, I've got pretty big hands so wrapping my hands around an individual joy con I, I played like the first several days of the game in the two-player mode like i was playing as mario on the one controller and sydney was playing as cappy for me mm-hmm. and um i i think it's fine um but i definitely see the appeal of maybe like a little plastic insert that you can pop the joy con into just give yourself a little more to hold on to Wow, I couldn't. I don't know if I how because you got to use the shoulder buttons for so yeah. much, and that that it seems works. to be the real weak point of it. But it was okay for you. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, but it's but them separate. I feel I don't have huge hands, and I feel like the them separate is just super comfortable. Uh, it's pretty amazing. I I did grab the pro controller. That's a surprisingly comfortable controller as I've well. Heard, yeah. Yeah, probably one of the most comfortable controllers. And the re- the great thing about it, it has a ridiculous battery life on it. Mm, so yeah. it's I mean uh, sort of the Joy-Cons to be fair. Yeah, I've I've never had to worry about it. So I'll give them that. And the nice thing about it is it's so easy to just charge them and set them aside. I mean, just speaking about the Switch as hardware, I just recently got mine. It's one of my it's one of my favorite consoles of all time. I love it. I love the idea. It re- it finally takes the the cons of the Wii and the Wii U were that they were underpowered. Um, but now the pro of it being an actual portable console completely yeah. makes up for that. And you know, Mario has it has some high res textures here and there, and then it has some parts where it's you know, maybe limited in what it can do, but Nintendo always proves that, especially now that they're in the HD era, Nintendo proves that it's all about art design. At least for me, I find that art design trumps everything else. Like I know if you're going to play a PS4 game or, uh, you know, on PC, this era, you can get some higher res textures and stuff, but I find because people are using a lot of the same engines, you kind of get a, like a lot of really similar looking things. Like, the realistic human face on most modern, say, PS4, PC games is starting to look really, really similar. And when you're going for that, um, if you're trying to look realistic anyway, that stuff we've seen in the past will age a lot quicker. Whereas Absolutely. many, many Nintendo games, even on the Wii U, still look unbelievable. You know, still look I mean, really heck, good. Even, even Mario Galaxy on the Wii still looks phenomenal. Like you yeah. can still play that on a big 1080 screen, even if it's a, like a 480p game. It still looks great. Yeah, that's why I'd mentioned that ever since the sort of uh, the the uh, yeah ever since the HD era, the weak. I mean, that's the only weakness is that it looks blurry. But still, once you've played it for a bit, your eyes get used to it, and the art direction is still so nice to look at. So the game looks yeah. great. I'd say uh, it sounds wonderful, and it yeah. controls. That's always been one of the strengths of Mario ever since it started and ever since ever since they dominated 2D control and ever since 64 hit it out of the park immediately. Uh, it controls amazing. The only caveat I have, and I've mentioned it many times, is the motion controls. I was so disappointed mm. to see that they really went strong on motion controls. And I don't mind if there truly was... They say, oh, you don't need the motion controls. They're not mandatory. They're not mandatory for most things. However... If you want to, ha- if you can, okay, let's, for example, uh, you can roll Mario like a ball on the ground and he's, it's faster than him running. Yeah. Um, and you don't need to use motion controls. However, if you do use the motion controls, you'll go faster than you ever could if you didn't. And there's a couple things that are locked behind motion controls and things like his spinning cap move is very, very powerful and needs to be done very precise because it's usually when people are close to you that you can do without it, but it's a lot slower to activate. So I feel discriminated against in a first world problem kind of way, but they're um, by not wanting to use motion controls and finding them more difficult to use. And even though that sounds like a bit of a whiny problem, there are people that might have disabilities, wrist pain, something like that, where motion controls are, are not something they want to be doing. And I, I like that they made it semi optional, but I still feel that it's mandatory enough. If you want to unlock the most powerful abilities. Did you go into the menu and like hard turn off motion controls? Yes. Okay. I've left them on. Uh, I rarely use them, but I, I know what you mean in terms of like 
when Mario's climbing a pole and you have to shake the Joy-Cons to make him climb faster. Yeah. I definitely feel like that was something that, yeah, really, could you not have mapped fast climb to another button or something? Um, I didn't even know that making Mario roll that you use the Joy-Cons to make him move faster. I just press the button with timed inputs to make him gain like the burst of speed. Hmm. I could be wrong um, about that. Maybe, you know, maybe with timing, you can achieve the same as the role, as the motion. And the motion is just like a more, uh, a less, less demanding way of achieving. That's that. probably, I feel like that's what it is. I feel like when you're doing the rolling mechanic, you can shake the joy cons, uh, to keep it like a consistently fast pace, but yeah. you can also use the button input with proper rhythmic timing to make, to get the same. That's probably speed what it is. Boost. Right. Right. Does it get, does it, I do you know. remember if it turns I a different tried. color? It turns yellow. Yeah. That's probably what it is. Okay, so I could just be wrong about that. I mean, it's a game where you sort of... I haven't really keep... experimented with it, so... Yeah, I had turned the motion controls off, and then I turned them back on, because um, I didn't think I was gaining anything by turning them off, uh, the, unless I was accident... And I ne was never accidentally uh, doing the motion controls, yeah. even though I turned the motion control sensitivity up as high as it can go, because I don't want to be doing, like, this all the time. And certain things yeah. like throwing his hat up into the air, you have to lift the Joy-Con straight up as opposed to doing, like, an upward flick. I find that pretty mm -hmm. difficult to do. So it's just... That's the only... Yeah. That's probably the only disappointment I have with this game. I mean... Uh, anything else? Uh, you know, it's the same thing. Like, I'll admit that in Breath of the Wild, I felt like the motion controls... Um, specifically, those tilt and tumble challenges mm. there's only like a couple of them in the game where you have to like control something that tilts or moves or like this giant hammer that you have to swing oh my god those just didn't work like i i might be one of the most accommodating of motion controls and when people say oh it doesn't work for me it's like well it works for everyone else no right. those things did not work and it, it drove me nuts like the way i had to like contort the joy cons to like finally get a angle of swing is like this doesn't feel natural at all and that's what really motion controls are meant to make things feel natural that's why yeah. having the one-to-one -one, the truly one-to-one -one motion in vr when you're using something like the vive that's why that feels so great is because you actually have this realistic motion input in the virtual space but um anyway con control stuff aside is there other stuff that you want you want to touch upon in the game yeah, um, what sets this Mario apart from others is that the levels are massive. This is a, yeah, this is a big design absolutely. change from Mario 64 was sandboxy, but they were smaller because they were limited with space. Uh, Mario Sunshine were a lot bigger. Galaxy shrunk it down and was a nice mix of obstacle course with a bit of sandboxiness. Absolutely. Three, 3D World was totally obstacle course. This went huge, and yeah. there are a few changes they made to the game that I think really support that. Because of, with games, I think it's it's obviously most effective when the game mechanics are working uh, in a synergistic way. And I find in the smaller ones, it made sense to go after less amount of stars, and each time you grab a star, it's a really big deal. But yeah. in this one, the moons are sometimes... So it's it's almost shocking when you first get some of them and it's like, oh, all you did is ground pound an area or you like yeah. walked around a, an area. But that makes sense because these levels are so big, you wouldn't want to be sucked out every time and go back. Also, no, because they're not. and because they're so big and you're going to be doing some backtracking, you need the smaller moons to kind of um, just kind of be a few breadcrumbs along and just to kind of keep the momentum up of like, well, I'm not able to get that really challenging one, but I was able to get... Uh, a couple smaller ones along the way or like maybe while I'm trying to how do I get into that cage one that's so difficult oh but here's another one and it's just that's a way of sort of keeping it pretty interesting and I I yeah. think that supports how big the levels are also yeah, there's also the there's a compass and a map and warp points which is yeah huge absolutely even even the fact that the, the moons restore your health when you pick them up like that's also just a nice way to like oh you're like low on health you've got mm. like one third of your health remaining and then you find a moon and hey you're back up to full actually speaking of health and what supports these large maps and the experimentation of going after moons and just this is a this is a mario game you could sit and like mess around with and think about a certain challenge for a long time 
um, is that they did it. They finally did away with the like very archaic lives and game over. And yes, you never lose yeah, any I was progress. Touch on that. You lose. You Love lose it. a few coins. There's so many coins in this game, um, and it's it's nice. I don't I don't worry about dying. I don't worry about trying something. I never feel like I'm gonna have to get zapped into a level and walk all the way back because you can warp. Well, if you get tired of this spot, just warp back. Yeah, warp all over the place. Die. It's just, it's that is perfect and that is that's a, a really genius evolution that works so well with it when we did our episode on traversal they did everything like pretty spot on to how i was expecting them to um and just in terms of like there's the warp points that let you jump between key points in the world and then getting from any one of those key points to exactly where you want to be they have a lot of stuff in there between the power lines between the uh glidey lizard yeah the glidey lizard the jaxi like there's a whole bunch yeah. of things that make it easy for you to get from anywhere to anywhere so mm -hmm. I, I love that it, and it just feels great right like because getting there should not be the challenge it's what yeah. you do when you're there that is the challenge yeah and you know in the earlier levels um I streamed the first level and I was a little bit, I was pretty critical of the game. I thought, I thought the worlds were too big. There wasn't enough to do. There wasn't enough challenge, but like every, I should have known. Cause it's like with every Mario game, it's, they just master introducing people. Every Mario game, yeah. Nintendo thinks people have never played any video game in their life. And this could be the first one. So they started off slow, but by the time you get to levels three and four, I mean, I just got to a certain level and, uh, cause we don't want to have any spoilers. And all of a sudden, there are some areas in there that I can't even begin to comprehend how you would get to these areas. But they it's like a smorgasbord. It's like a buffet of, do you want to have the simple choice over here? Or do you want to try this crazy, spicy, exotic food? So if you're not quite ready for the precise inventive platforming that it might take for a certain area, there's tons of stuff for you to get. And with the currency, they have lots of stars everywhere because that refills your health. That's what yeah. is your lives now. Um, but then they have these small small uh there's sort of these like rare much rare currency for each world that yes. allow you to get things like loot and hats and they give you health but they're just kind of something else that, that is really fun to collect and um it, it kind of ends up feeling a bit like a like a banjo kazooie game in the way where there's a lot more things to collect but i don't think they go overboard with it and i think no. there's always a challenge to getting those things that feels good it doesn't just feel like mindless collecting we're gonna get to that in a second okay um because I have I have a, a somewhat conflicted opinion on that. Mm. Um, one thing, though, that I do really appreciate, uh, just while we're still talking about power moons, is the fact that you need only like a minuscule subset of the moons from one world before you're allowed to go on to the next. Like the fact that you can, if you want to, just blaze through every single world. Um, when I made it to the sort of first uh, large kingdom, the the sort of desert kingdom, I spent a lot of time collecting like 45 moons before moving on to the next zone. But I actually think that it's more advantageous to blaze through the key quests in each zone first, unlock all the worlds, and then go back and do other challenges. Mm -hmm. And that's actually something that I don't like about this game. I don't like the fact that there are certain things that you can't do the first time you're in a world. Like in Bonneton, there are 17 moons you can collect, but you can't get most of them until you go back. Like they're uh, okay. all just locked off. The same yeah. thing with the second world that you go into, the sort of like Cascade Falls area. There's a ton of moons in that space, but you can only get them once you've come back to that world. Mm. And I did all this exploration in those first two worlds trying to do things that never amounted to anything because it's like cool i found my way to this place and there's just a locked door that i can't get through yet why yeah not? yeah exactly and that's the thing is is why it's like whenever you're going to limit the player with a mechanic why yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's it's one of those things where i absolutely think it's not a bad assumption to lead people into an experience slowly but give people the option of like if you're already a master at this experience give them a fast track give them a way that they can mm -hmm. prove that they're ready 
for the bigger challenges. Like I've I've played a Mario game before. I know how to do my backflips and my long jumps and all that sort of stuff. I definitely need more practice with Cappy since that's a new mechanic in this game. Mm-hmm. But yeah, just overall, I it's tough because I like the feeling of coming back to a world and finding new things to experience in it. I just wish that there were there was less gating, I guess. Yeah, that's true. And it's I mean, they could if if they were worried that you could maybe get so many moons in one level that you could then skip through the levels, like you could go to the next level and you could just keep Yeah, but that's char- not the way the game's structured. Right, because you have to get a certain amount from every kind, right? In each to, world, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it is because um, that would have been a concern in old Mario games because you could absolutely go through and clear one world and then skip a later world because of the way that you needed uh, certain amounts of stars and that gated your progress throughout the game. But even still, is there not is there, is there not some feeling that if you've bought the game, like you just want to play it your own way? It's not like <laughs> it's not like this is a competition in any way. This is a, a completely single player experience, and it's yeah. built it's built on a sandbox mentality so it seems at odds with the design to limit people in a way and force you to backtrack which you know like if you know, it just might not be in your mentality to want to come back to these levels once you've done like maybe because there are lots of different types of gamers and some people who have more like um i don't want to use the term ocd but uh i will and maybe that's just their thing like they're like i gotta complete everything here i want to explore i mean it's the same thing with me if i ever encounter i'm playing legend of dragoon right now and a lot of times there's these split paths and immediately I think, oh, I don't want to go down the wrong one and then and not be able to backtrack, you know, and like maybe I missed something. And that's, you know, that could be found here. I've with this one, I've generally just explored until I kind of can't anymore. And, and then I just kind of hop on to the next level. But I don't really know if I'd want to come back. Maybe if I was bored and I was looking for something else to do once they do. But I feel like you're just going to want to go on the journey and then finish and that's it. Yeah. I mean, I definitely want to get as close to complete, like as close to collecting all the moons in this game as possible. Mm. Um, When I played through Mario Galaxy, I got the 60 original stars. I didn't play through the whole game a second time as Luigi, but I did perfect the first game, at least up to the first halfway point. Basically, I got all the stars. Um, And in Mario Galaxy 2, I could not finish that game. I got just too frustrated with the challenges they were throwing at you. Um... In Mario 3D World, I got like up to the super secret final world, but some of the challenges in there were just too tough, couldn't complete those. Um, so I don't know if I'm going for 100% of completion on this. I, I'm i not a completionist. I want to play it as long as it's still fun, which mm-hmm. is why in Mario Galaxy 2, I just stopped. It's like, I'm not having fun with this anymore. I'm not going to keep playing it. Um, at this point, I don't know if I'm going to rate Odyssey higher or lower than Galaxy, um, just because Galaxy was so perfect in so many ways. I mean, the music in this game's great. I don't think it beats the symphony orchestra for Galaxy. Um, The visuals are beautiful in this game, and they're definitely higher fidelity than they were in Galaxy, Uh, and there's definitely some brilliant art direction. Like, I'd say if these games were released, like, giving even consideration for the eras that both these games came out in, I think that you have to rate them roughly equivalent in terms of, like, visual aesthetic, just in terms Mm -hmm. of what was possible then versus what's possible now. Um, I definitely like the the secret-laden nature of this game. Uh, And this, I'm sort of jumping back to something that I was alluding to earlier. Uh, I love how many moons are spread throughout every world. Yeah. But sometimes I feel like the way they've hidden them is a little cheap. Have you found that? Um, There are a couple, I've I've mentioned a few earlier, that are in these cages that just kind of tend to be out in the middle of nowhere and um, I I haven't explored enough, but it doesn't seem immediately apparent. Because I haven't been trying to get it you know every moon i can it hasn't come up as a as a point of frustration but i could see if i was trying to clear everything in a certain area before moving on 
um, then that can be more frustrating. I've kind of just, uh, I spend a little bit of time on it. If I can't figure it out, I move on and there's always another moon around the corner. Sometimes yeah. they, uh, they can actually be a bit like frustratingly easy in a way where mm. you're like, all right, I just bang my head against something for so long. And then here's one that I like to do is it was just there. <laughs> you yeah. just did a butt. You just did a ground pound, a butt pound. Um, that, no, that's, that's the worst. Don't, right, don't yeah. call it that. <laughs> Anyways. Um, the, uh, the ones I'm actually talking about are the ones where they abuse the camera. Those are the ones oh, that okay. I like the least. The ones where you walk up to the edge of something and you have to tilt the camera like right down and look over like, oh, is there a hidden ledge over the edge? Uh, like, there's not really anything challenging about that. It's just, did you walk around every single edge of everything looking yeah. down over the edge? I See, don't I, like that. I like those because I, f- I feel like they're not – because I don't view them as necessary – I just, mm-hmm. I view them as a reward for exploration and just, did you really, like, I think of that as a, Thoroughly as a positive. explore every place. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I feel kind of conflicted on this because at first I did like it, but I feel like eventually they get to the point where they, um, like, okay, for anyone who's played this game, you're, you end up like walking into these zones, like you have to open a door with your hat and then you end up in a sort of sort of more obstacle course type yeah, zone. Yeah, those you know are my I'm favorite parts. About. Yeah, and they're great, and they all have two moons, every one of them. There's always the obvious one at the end of the obstacle course, and then there's one other one hidden somewhere. And I feel like a little too often that second moon is just hidden, oh, did you tilt the camera up? Oh, right. did you tilt the camera over a ledge? Or, oh, did you look 180 degrees behind you? I feel like they relied on that sort of camera abuse uh, of like where the player's perspective and their attention is focused on just a little too much to pad out the second moon in each of those secret zones. Yeah, where especially because it doesn't really work with the nature of those levels. Those those levels to me are such a throwback to the two dimensional Mario's and and say Galaxy and three D World. In that it's an obstacle course. It's about going in a straight line. It's just about skill. It's about speed and momentum or being careful. And it's and looking around and exploring is completely not what those levels should be about. And a lot of them, well, at least one of them I know of, takes Cappy away from you, and then yes, you're just that'll about- happen actually quite frequently. Okay. And, uh, you know, and that makes sense. It's kind of like they did the same thing in uh, Sunshine where you'd have levels where there yeah. was no flood and it was basically exactly. an obstacle course. So, yeah, it would be better if they had uh, the, the the secondary moon being more of like, can you do this very skill-intensive uh, acrobatic maneuver? like, And have it very clearly shown. Where yeah. it's like, there it is, and then they dare you to go get it, which I think would, would fit more in the spirit of it, not just like, hey, you know, if you use your Joy-Con motion control camera, then you'll find the thing. Yeah, I mean, I don't mind the idea of having to discover the sort of second moon. I, I love the idea, the idea of it being an additional challenge. Um, I don't like the idea of just obsessively sweeping the camera up and down and over and around and everything. Like... Usually if I go into one of those zones and I clear the whole thing without finding the moon, it's like, oh, okay, go back to the beginning, yeah. obsessively sweep the camera around. Oh, okay, there it is. I just didn't look high up enough there. That's when it becomes the worst part of, of uh, Banjo-Kazooie and the Collectathon. Yeah. And you again, know. it's not mandatory. You don't have to collect all those moons. True. I could, I could easily skip them if I wanted to. I just feel like, well, what am I going to unlock forgetting all of them and i just i i wish that rather than having like a thousand moons in the game and i don't know how many (laughs) there actually are but i'm i'm sitting at 300 and something so far and i'm not much further in terms of unlocking worlds in the game than you are um i feel like just rather rather than having so many moons just make them Maybe a little more memorable. Maybe a, maybe not every single secret zone has to contain two moons. That's all. Mm. Okay. Just quality over quantity, right? And that's what this game is all about. It is all about quality over quantity of experience. Like the uh, the one thing I do like though about having many moons scattered throughout the world 
is that it really plays into the Switch's like pick up and play nature. Yes. The fact that you can like conceivably pop the switch open and between subway stops find a moon and mm-hmm. then put it back into sleep mode, put it in your backpack. That's really cool. That you can have like this tiny condensed Mario experience that you can take with you on the go and play in short yeah, bursts. Absolutely. So that makes sense. It's it's like the Korok seeds and Zelda or actually yeah. more like the shrines in Zelda. Um, it's, uh, like, like on the N64. No, I think Korok Seeds is more accurate, I think, because it's just how many moons there are. In terms of that, some of them are about the equivalent difficulty of Korok Seeds, some of them are more like the difficulty of Shrines. True. And it's, um, like the N64 designed their, their controller and the hardware around Mario 64, and then kind of said, all right, every other game, uh, try to, try to work with this, third parties. Uh, we have four C buttons. Um, this definitely feels the same too, where they actually, I feel like they almost designed Mario to work with the hardware this time where they go like, all right, what would make the best experience for Mario? And it's, I mean, going back to it again, I am so happy. I have this switch. I love, I love this console. It's a, yeah. it's a dream, man. It's like, it's, it's so slick. It's so nicely designed. You know, there's a few things here, like my left Joy-Con will desync, desync sometimes, but I think you can send it into a Nintendo and you can grab yes. it. You can get a new one. And speaking of that, I, I read somebody uh, had posted Nintendo's response to them trying to get a dead pixel screen replaced. And I don't know if it was on the 3DS or if it was on the Switch, but N- Nintendo's official response was basically, try playing with it. See if you don't notice it anymore. If it's if, And then they even said this, if the tiny pixel still bothers you, then send it in and we'll fix it. And like that's where Nintendo can be. They just shoot themselves in the foot with us sometimes. But they're, this is a lot better. Where the Wii U, everything that was wrong about the Wii U tablet is fixed. Almost everything is fixed here. I mean, it is just an amazing piece. And how I'm constantly surprised by how well it works slipping into that dock. Put the Joy-Cons on. It starts charging automatically. I mean, the only thing they really could have improved is the included... Um, uh, thing that holds Netflix, the joy con oh yeah that too <laughs> that you know that should charge your joy cons they it and they offer one because they offer one that you can buy it feels yeah. re- it feels very cheap that they uh that they didn't include that what did you it's what did you say i just said like netflix youtube just some third-party apps well, that's Would've the thing nice. yeah you were saying that it, i mean it is we've had tablets that can do that for the longest time and the wii u could do that and uh even the wii could do that so i mean my my razor tv can't <laughs> Mm. I published Robo's World to the uh, Razer Forge TV, and it doesn't have Netflix, so it's not a ubiquitous thing. But at the same time, for something that is uh, such so high profile as yeah. a console, I feel like eh, would have been great if we had that, and it would be would be great if we even had any word as to when it was coming. But that's not what we're talking about right now. Um, overall, Odyssey. Um, you mentioned that originally you were kind of not loving it, loving it, but your uh, your um, opinion is changing, improving over time. Yeah, I'd, I'd say it, in the beginning I was. Uh, I mean, if we want to give it like an out of ten, well, forever for whatever it's worth at this point, how much I've played, I assumed any solid Mario game would be at least an eight. But there were moments in the first couple levels where I thought, I don't know, this is a little bit lower. It's kind of not engaging me in a way. It was too simple, but. I was fooled once again by the great difficulty curve. And once it ramped up and got a lot more interesting and they stopped trying to teach you things, it's it's become a really special game. And, and it's a game that reveals itself to you. And it's a game that rewards um, just messing around with. It's like it takes the sandbox pretty seriously. It has so many elements and mechanics of it that work perfectly well together. It seems like a real rebirth where, at, like you mentioned, 3D World before and we were saying it's like a safe bet yeah it was a safe bet it was uninspired it was just here's a mario game that's fun with a lot of people and it did that well but this feels like breath of the whereas breath of the wild revitalized my interest in zelda this re- definitely reestablished my faith in uh, the mario series and, and in nintendo as well that they have a lot of great ideas still and it's uh yeah i think it's a really special mario that's going to stand on its own and is just getting better the more i play it I, I couldn't have said it better myself. Like, I think that uh, Breath of the Wild kind of breaks the grading curve 
Mm. It's just in terms of like this game is so, so close to being just absolutely perfect in every way and it executes on some things in what we would have previously given games 10 out of 10, this does it better. Yeah. So in, in a lot of ways, what we considered perfect before, Breath of the Wild does better than that. So that I feel like that's why giving it like numerical scores is always kind of tough. I mean, like at this point... I acknowledge Mario Galaxy to be a 9 out of 10 experience. There's definitely a lot I loved yeah. about that game and then just a tiny bit I didn't. I feel like right now I have to, I'm sitting at around the same sort of experience. Like that's don't think of it as a 9 out of 10 experience. Just think of it in terms of I really love it. There's a couple tiny things that I've touched upon in this podcast that hold me back from saying absolute like 10 out of 10 experience in the way that breath of the wild certainly was deserving of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, even then I, in our discussions about breath of the wild, I, I've, I'm sure I mentioned that there were some tiny things that I didn't love about that game. You know, I think there's always, there is forever going to be room for improvement in an experience, but at the end of the day, you just have to look at what you've got and what you've got is an amazing Mario game. Yeah. I mean, we should do an episode on uh, on reviewing games in the future because that's a really important topic. But um, yeah, absolutely. But, and if I was going to compare that, like if if a Switch owner was asking me what should I get, Breath of the Wild or this, I mean, it, like with reviewing, it comes down to personal preference, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. What somebody loves, I might hate, and vice versa, of course. Yeah. But I mean, a Breath of the Wild for me is better. And yeah. uh, and when you were when you were just talking about it. I find it really hard to think back and like, what did I not like about Breath of the Wild? It was, it was a ma- for me. Breath of the Wild was magical from the start, yeah, to the end, even with uh, an abrupt Ganon battle. However, I'll uh, I'll reserve judgment on Mario obviously until I've played the whole thing because yeah. I have a friend that writes reviews for Nineties and he said that Odyssey sat around an eight for him for the for most of the game, and then the end and the post game put it up to about a 10 so wow so i'm pretty okay. excited to see Can't that wait conversely i saw one of the first reviews i read maybe from polygon said they felt a bit repped off because they went out of their way to collect as many moons as possible and didn't have didn't feel there was enough reward for all of that mm. but they could be talking about two different things where he's just talking about the challenges and things at the end so yeah so who knows what that's going to be and i, I like that that's not spoiled and because this game and breath of the wild seem to be about exploration and a sense of wonder and they've delivered that once again all right well let's wrap this up uh, you can find me on twitter at game think talk uh, you can watch videos like this one at our uh, youtube channel 90s kid you can uh, go to 90s kid.com and find articles i write about gameology and videos and all kinds of things how about you attila you can follow me on Twitter at Bluish Green Pro or my personal Twitter handle, Attila Gabriel. You can also visit our website, um, well, the website on which I host the podcast, bluishgreenproductions.com, where you can find games that I've made and submit user questions or feedback about the show. Cool. Any, any to read out? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> no, not yet. Okay. Well, you could be the first. All right. Bye, everybody. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.